Welcome to the Northern Miner Podcast. My name is Adrian Pocabelli. We have a wonderful show lined up for you today. We have Stephen Stewart from Young Mining Professionals, and he is the chair there. And they've been doing good work for several years now. And I'm excited for this interview. Uh, it was really fun. I've seen Stephen a couple of times at the Canadian Mining Symposium in London. So it was great to catch up with him. And it was just a really, really nice conversation. So that is coming up. Taking a step back, I'm noticing Rick Rule is saying buy gold stocks, and I totally agree with him. Not financial advice. Full disclosure, I do not own any gold stocks, but I do think they're attractive here. I'm neck deep in what I call deep crypto on the Binance smart chain, buying sea monkeys and shrimp. I do own that stuff and call me insane. I call it sci-fi finance. Again, I, I tell my friends it's like living in 2030 being in some of this stuff. It's exciting, it's entertaining, and it's profitable, hopefully. Hopefully. Let's see. As I told a friend who I convinced to ape into this stuff, worst case scenario, we walk away with a great story about how we bought the shrimp and farmed the sea monkeys, and then the tarot cards came with the special... Yeah, it, it's like Dungeons and Dragons or something, but apparently it's, it's called finance in, in 2021, but it feels like 2030. There we are. So, yeah, so gold stocks are looking very attractive. Their uranium stocks continue to move higher. Let's just take a quick look at what's going on in the stocks here. Yeah, look at Uranium Energy Corp, $2.71 per share. Now, just for context, at the bottom of the crisis last year was $0.38. Cents. So, I mean, this is what's possible. Like, you know how people talk about putting cash on the side? Like, it's not a joke. Keep cash on the side. Never be fully invested. It's a really hard thing to do, actually, because when you're invested, you think you're going to be making money, so you always want to put all your money into things. And it's actually, last March, if you had 10% free in cash, you could have picked up uranium energy at $0.38, cents, and that's just a no-brainer, right? Again, today, we are talking $2.71. What else do we have Cameco on the Canadian Toronto Stock Exchange, $22.90. Again, last year, we're talking $9.29, and you really had all year to buy this one. I mean, it was at, you know, as recently as November 3rd, it was eleven ninety two, And it was at the end of November, about December 1st, that Cameco started to move and all the uranium stocks. So we're kind of four months into a move. Good news, I have Rowan Ratty next week and he's from it's a global x etfs and he is a commodities analyst very very interesting discussion we had yesterday he's very knowledgeable on the uranium market so uranium bulls stay tuned for next week's episode it is a really interesting episode uh we both had a great time with that conversation and really enjoyed it so there's a lot to learn there and a really cutting edge take from Rowan. Continuing on, just looking at final stocks. NXE, Next Gen Energy, is always an interesting one to watch because they have that Rook One property. It's at $4.67. It was one of the first to really launch out of the crisis last March. Just bring that up. You know, this Apple app really takes a lot more energy for my computer. The Stocks app should be pretty simple, guys. It shouldn't take like 50% 50, 50 of my RAM. Yeah, so look at this. So before the crisis, pre-March last year, next gen around a buck 50, buck 60 per share. In the crisis, it only went down to 80 cents. So it was down 50%, which when you consider how chaotic that was, that's not a bad performance. And then right away by April, it was at $2 higher than before. And remember, uranium stocks kind of had a little bit of a launch coming out of the crisis, and then they chilled. And then this one actually performed quite well. At the end of November, it was $2.33, and it went all the way up to $5.06 February 21st. It's taking a little breather now at 467 Really impressive performance from uranium stocks. And gold stocks, let's look at that very quickly. Barrick's you know, on the U.S. exchange, $20.77. P.E., 
of 15.89, so let's say 16 PE with a yield of 1.77%. You know, Rick Rule is pretty good at calling these things. And when everybody hates an investment, it's usually pretty attractive. Newmont's at 60 bucks, $60.78 per share. Let's quickly look at the PE on that, 17.5, yield of 3.73%. Now, would, uh, you know, talking to my mom, I call it the traditional financial system. For the, in the traditional financial system, that's a really nice yield. Newmont looks like it's kind of ready to do something, hasn't done much for a while. Nice little value play. Again, not financial advice. I don't own any of these gold stocks. Um, just pontificating here. But it is funny because in crypto, like to get 10% on your USDC, your US dollar coin, which is easy to transfer, just go to the Celsius app. It's like 8 or 10%, okay? And that's low in crypto, okay? So money goes where it's treated best. Money goes where it's treated best. And so that's the real problem that the traditional financial system faces is, I think, yield. Yield is such a big deal and there's just going to be this magnet of money going into digital assets because it gets treated better there. Some people were saying, Adrian, what are you going to do? How are you like, what do you do with this money? Can you off ramp it? And you can, you can. It's maybe not super easy, but you can. But as Raul Powell says, why would you? Why would you take your money out of crypto? So I leave that with you. Perhaps a controversial statement for many here. Nevertheless, this uranium bull market continues. And with that, if you want to find us online, you can find us at northernminer.com. You can find us on Twitter at Northern Miner. You can find us on Instagram at The Northern Miner. You can find us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, where we also host these podcasts and wherever podcasts are available, including Spotify, Stitcher, and Apple Podcasts. And with that, let's turn to the news. And a quick note just before we begin on the news, just about say crypto and everything, what, what I always tell people, because I actually get a lot of solicitation as to what's going on, how do I do this? And a reminder, this is not financial advice, any of this. But what I do recommend is education, because the problem with investing in and not knowing what you're investing in is you end up buying high and selling low. Because Let's say you buy Bitcoin at 60000 and you don't understand why you bought Bitcoin, and then it drops to 40000 You panic sell because you're just hoping for a quick buck. But if you understand it and you believe in it, you just go, ah, oh, cool, I can buy some more. And that's the difference. So it's education, education, education. Do not buy anything that you don't have a clue about is sort of my thing. So that's what I always tell people to first do, because otherwise you buy high and you sell low. On to the news. Uh, we're getting some record earnings from Franco Nevada and Silver Wheaton. Just want to touch on these. Franco Nevada posts record results, grows royalty portfolio. So they're getting aggressive. Magda Gardner, Canadian Mining Journal. Franco Nevada's fourth quarter and full year results release include record annual results, two new stream and royalty additions, as well as a 15.4% increase to the quarterly dividend starting in June. Now, for context, I think Exxon generally would do like a 10% increase pretty regularly. And they were sort of seen for the longest time as the gold standard on the dividend. So not a small increase from Franco Nevada on their dividends, so 15.4% increase. The company has also announced that it has adopted a goal of at least 40% of diverse representation at the board and senior management levels. And just looking over the numbers, so they sold, Franco Nevada sold 521,564 gold equivalent ounces, a 1% increase over 2019, generating $1 billion in revenue. 20% over last year and reporting an adjusted EBITDA of $839 million, a 25% increase from last year. These numbers include sales of 147,476 gold equivalent ounces in the fourth quarter. The company closed out the year with no debt, $534 million of cash and equivalents, 
versus $132 million at the end of 2019, and $1.9 billion in available capital. And we have a quick quote from the CEO, Paul Brink. And don't forget, he was on last week's episode joining us at the Global Mining Symposium. And here he is in the news the following week. And he was saying that the strong commodity prices drove the record financials, quote, with record precious metal prices through the year and the recovery of energy prices in the second half of the year, Franco Nevada generated record financial results. So I don't want to dwell on this too much, but I do want to call our attention that the streamers are doing very, very well. Also turning to Wheaton Precious Metals, we have a headline here from Northern Miner staff. Wheaton enjoys record 2020 revenue of $1.1 billion with 627,000 ounces of gold equivalent sold. The figure includes sales of 367,000 ounces of gold, 22.9 million ounces of silver, and 22,000 ounces of palladium. I'm rounding these off, these numbers, just so we don't get lost in the weeds here. Operating cash flow for the year was $765 million, which is a record. The company reduced its net debt by $275 million, leaving it at $2 million. Shareholders were granted a fourth quarter dividend of $0.13 cents per common share. And look at these costs. Average cash costs in 2020 were $425 per ounce gold equivalent, compared to $411 in 2019. This resulted in cash operating margins of $1,323 per ounce gold equivalent sold, an increase of 38% compared with 2019. That's some serious profits. Going forward, Wheaton offered 2021 guidance of 370,000 to 400,000 ounces of gold, 22.5 million to 24 million ounces of silver, and 40 to 45,000 gold equivalent from other metals. Total gold equivalent ounces will be between 720,000 to 780,000 ounces. Production outlook uh, is expected to reach 810,000 gold equivalent ounces in five years and 830,000 ounces in 10 years. So again, the streamer's doing very, very well. We also have a lot of M&A this week, which was kind of noteworthy. You wonder, you know, with gold stocks being kind of depressed, yet the gold price being high, this kind of looks like a great opportunity, doesn't it, for these senior blue chip miners? So Newmont is buying GT Gold. And again, maybe this explains why there's m and I mean, it's, it seems like great conditions and these people are paid a whole lot of money to figure these things out and to make the right moves at the right time. Newmont, the world's number one gold miner, is acquiring all the shares it doesn't already own in Canadian Explorer GT Gold. In a cash deal valued at about $311 million, the transaction will see the U.S. mining giant buying the remaining 85.1% of common shares of GT Gold. It doesn't already have for $3.25 per share, a 38% premium to the 20-day volume weighted average price of GT Gold shares on the Toronto Stock Exchange. And their primary asset is the Tatoga Gold Copper Project located in the traditional territory of the Teltan Nation. 14 kilometers west of Red Chris Copper Gold Mine. Now, we've had representatives from the Talton Nation at the Canadian Mining Symposium. They have a lot of experience in mining. I think they've been doing it for generations, if I remember right. So, very interesting. And we have a quote from Newmont President and CEO Tom Palmer on the Talton Nation, where we are committed to continue building a constructive and respectful relationship with the Talton Nation including the community of Iskut, which is near the project in anticipation of exploring this highly prospective area. We understand and acknowledge that Talton consent is necessary for advancing the Totoga project, and we will partner with the Talton Nation at all levels and with the government of British Columbia to ensure a path forward. So Newmont makes an acquisition in BC. Grand Columbia offers $315 million in friendly all-share offer for Gold X. And this is by Alicia Hyatt, Editor-in-Chief of the Canadian Mining Journal. Grand Columbia Gold is acquiring Gold X Mining in an all-share deal valued at $315 million. The combination of assets, Grand Columbia is producing Segovia operation and Gold X's Toro Paru advanced gold project in Guyana would create, quote, a Latin American-focused growth platform, end quote, and the offer implies a 39% premium based on the closing price of Gold X shares on March 12th. So a similar premium as the last one. 
And again, if you're going off low gold stock prices and you're offering a 40% premium, sounds like uh, not a terrible deal, does it? So Grand Columbia offers $315 million for gold X. Continuing on. First Majestic buys Nevada gold mine from Sprott. And let's see what this is. First Majestic Silver is buying the Jarrett Canyon gold mine in Elko County, Nevada from Sprott Mining for $470 million in shares and 5 million share purchase warrants. As part of the deal, Sprott Mining President Eric Sprott will complete a $30 million private placement investment in First Majestic. The Canadian miner said it had identified opportunities to enhance the mine's costs and production profile, as well as near-term brownfield potential between the SSX and Smith Mines. And Jarrett Canyon was discovered in 1972 and has been in production since 1981. It's 40 years now. The asset has delivered more than 9.5 million ounces of gold. Last year, it produced 112,749 ounces of gold at a cash cost of $1,289 per ounce. So First Majestic makes a play. So there is a pattern at work here. Shifting gears, Fortescue based out of Australia, are, is fast-tracking its zero emissions target to 2030. It seems like it was only six months ago when a lot of these big blue-chip miners were saying, in 2050, we're going to be, you know, zero emissions. Now they're starting to speed up the process. You see the just the relentless pressure of ESG investing. I mean, if you want access to cheap capital or to capital period, uh, it's getting harder and harder to get it if you are not environmentally friendly. To put it bluntly, this is by Cecilia Jamasmi at Mining.com. Fortescue Metals Group, the world's fourth largest iron ore producer, has brought forward a self-imposed deadline to be carbon neutral in 10 years to 2030, about two decades earlier than its closest rivals BHP, Rio Tinto, and Valet. And I would almost ex start to expect similar announcements from BHP, Rio Tinto, and Valet because, you know what, 2050? Maybe it's realistic, but the uh, optics of 2050 sounds the translation is to your skeptical environmental investor is, well, you're kicking the can down the road. And that's Rio Tinto, who has actually been making some pretty big moves in BHP. Anyway, let's see what happens. I think everybody's putting an effort in at this point. They don't really have a choice. The Australian miner, Fortescue, said its subsidiary Fortescue Future Industries will be a key enabler of the new target through the development of green electricity, green hydrogen, and green ammonia projects in Australia. And we have a quote from Dan Gocher, climate director with the Australasian Center for Corporate Responsibility. Quote, Fortescue is now firmly leading corporate Australia with this commitment. Yeah, the 2030 zero emissions, that is pretty aggressive. Market Forces, another investor activist group, called on Fortescue to clarify the extent to which it planned to rely on purchasing carbon offsets. These could include investments in programs such as planting trees that naturally store carbon to mitigate emissions from its own operations and meet the new 2030 net zero target. Fortescue chief Elizabeth Gaines said the company was, quote, not ruling out the use of offsets, but would seek to limit their use. Quote, offsets would be a last course and only offsets that are reputable and meet a very high standard would be considered. End quote, Gaines said. Now, just a final quote. We have something really interesting here. Mining billionaire Andrew Forrest, Fortescue's founder and major shareholder, predicted the world's conversion to green energy and products would occur, quote, almost violently, end quote. He noted that most forecasts assumed that hydrogen produced from renewable energy would only become commercially viable in the 2030s. Quote, as of today's announcements, all those calculations will have to change, end quote. Forrest told reporters in a call on March 15th, and let's just take a look at the scope three. The company's climate change strategy only considers scope one and scope two greenhouse emissions, those directly generated by an organization, as well as indirect emissions from the power it buys to run its operations. Scope three emissions caused when a company's product is utilized, processed, or shipped to customers are yet to be addressed by Fortescue, which places the company behind BHP and Rio Tinto's recent pledges. So... Ahead in certain areas, behind in others. A very interesting move, and it continues. And finally, this is from mining.com, and I guess they got this from Bloomberg News, but the headline really stood out to me. 
VW plans to be battery juggernaut and 29 billion answer to Tesla. I hadn't heard that anywhere else. And so again, this is Bloomberg on mining.com. Volkswagen AG is stepping up efforts to unseat Tesla Incorporated as the dominant electric car maker with a plan to build six battery factories in Europe and invest globally in charging stations. VW already has agreements for two battery plants and is exploring four additional sites for a total capacity of 240 gigawatt hours by the end of the decade. It said Monday the push will cost some $29 billion and would make VW and its partners the world's second largest cell producer after China's contemporary Amperex technology company, according to Bloomberg NEF. And we have a quote from Chief Executive Officer Herbert Deese, who said during a webcast, quote, e-mobility has won the race. Our goal is to secure a pole position and the global scaling of batteries. So I just want to, you know, highlight that because Tesla gets a lot of the attention, but here VW is putting in $29 billion into electric cars. So this is happening. As all our experts tell us, those are your news stories. Now let's take a look at metal prices. Turning to metal prices, we'd like to thank our friends at mining.com slash markets for providing us with these prices each and every week. And on March 16th, gold is trading at $1,733.42. That is $31 higher than last week's quote. Silver is trading at $25.96 per ounce. That is that is 28 cents higher than last week's quote. Platinum is trading at $1,222.65. That is $51 higher than last week's quote. And palladium is trading at $2,515.47 per ounce. That is $200 higher than last week. And turning to our industrial metals, copper is trading two cents higher at $4.11 per pound. Aluminum is two cents lower at 97 cents per pound. Lead is four cents lower at 88 cents per pound. And nickel is nine cents lower at $7.33 per pound. Tin is at $14.02. That is $1.98 higher than last week. Our last sort of near-term high on our measurements was $13.31. So tin continues to rocket higher. I mean, a year ago, this thing was trading around 7 bucks. Cobalt is at $23.93 per pound. That is a penny lower than last week's quote. And zinc is at $1.27 per pound. That is two cents higher than last week. So what do we see? A, a platinum and palladium? Stand out, particularly palladium, at $2,515. That is the highest quote we've had here in the last uh, 18 months. That brings us all the way back to almost 18 months ago when it was $2,531. Not too much activity in the industrial metals apart from tin, which has shown a lot of strength. And those are your metal prices. And coming up, we have Stephen Stewart, Chair of Global Young Mining Professionals and the Young Mining Professionals Scholarship. And we have a really great talk about the Young Mining Professionals Awards. So good for both companies and students. See how you can get involved, whether it's giving back or helping yourself get through the school year and save yourself from taking a job at the coffee shop. And so with that, I really hope you enjoy this conversation and we'll see you on the other side. Joining us on the podcast, I'm pleased to welcome Stephen Stewart, who I've met a couple of times at the Canadian Mining Symposium when we used to host it in London. And Stephen is chairman of the Young Mining Professionals, and he is also chairman of the Young Mining Professionals Scholarship Fund, and he's also chairman of the OR Group. And Stephen, welcome to the program. 
Adrian, pleasure, uh, pleasure to, to be here. I only wish uh, we were meeting again back in London where we could both travel, but, uh, but, but a big fan of your podcast and uh, so glad to catch up. Well, that's great. It's, it's great to hear from you and it's great to at least see you again virtually. And so you guys have pretty big news that you have announced the winners of this year's Young Mining Professional. Now, is it the award or the scholarship? Could tell us what you guys are announcing. We have two fairly significant announcements. The one that, that was just made the other day was the Young Mining Professionals, the YMP Awards. Every year we give away the Ira Thomas and the Peter Monk Award for the top young person defined as under 40 in our industry. This year, of course, uh, the two winners were Matthew Fenton and uh, Maggie Lehman. Matthew's from Magaris, a uh, private equity company with a, with a couple assets here in Canada. And Maggie, of course, uh, works for Cisco Developments, and she's focused out in their caribou asset out in the BC. So, so that was big news. Um, uh, we, typically, we'd have the awards ceremony going on probably as we speak because we we hosted in, in parallel with the PDAC. But with everything being virtual, the actual ceremony itself is going to be on uh, March the 18th, where we'll give out the awards virtually. And of course, we're going to recognize them again in person in 2022 when we when we have the next year's uh, slate of winners. Uh, but we're excited. I think very worthy winners this year. So we're quite pleased with that announcement. So tell me about the actual process of the Young Mayan Professionals. So as far as I saw, it was people under 40. How do you go about choosing who gets what seems to be probably the, the biggest mining award for people under 40, I, I would guess? Well, I certainly think so. But uh, but obviously, I'm biased. But there's a few other awards. But I think this one has a real cachet and has really caught on. And so we're very we're very pleased with that. And certainly, I think the Northern Miner has helped us uh, communicate that as, as you are partners with it. So how, how we select the winners? Well, we go to the public. We're a better place to start in, in probably about in December or November, we start soliciting candidates and people can go on to our website at youngminingprofessionals.com and submit people who they feel deserve recognition. And we get submissions from all over the world. I think we got well over 100 from all six continents or the six uh, permanently inhabited continents this year, uh, our most ever. And then we go back and we shortlist it uh, by, uh, we have five voting entities and there's four chapters. And then of course the fifth vote comes from the uh, the Northern Miners. So we, we give them the list. We give all these five voting chapters the list, they come back uh, and they we basically pick the, the winner who has the most votes after the shortlist process. And if there is a, a tie, we do a runoff and then we revote. Uh, there wasn't a tie this year, but it was uh, both were convincing winners. But that's effectively the process. Finally, before we get on to the actual winners, how does the nomination process work? Like, is there basically a form on your website? So if I know someone, you know, next year that I think is the right person, do I have to be working for a mining company to nominate someone? How does the nomination process work? Well, you just go onto our website and uh, there is a form. I think we've taken the form down, obviously, because we're not soliciting uh, uh, nominees. But during that the nomination process, you go on our website, you 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 can write uh you know, write supporting words, pay, cut and paste their LinkedIn, give us anything, you know, convince us that this individual is worthy. And we go through, it's quite a process to evaluate that because there's an awful lot of information and a lot of things to consider. We take it very seriously. So, uh, but yeah, it's just as, as simple as a public nomination. And how many nominations do you tend to get? Or is that public information? No, it's, it's not, it's not, that it's not public. We, I think this year we got well over a hundred and, uh, and so it's, and it grows every year. And, you know, there's some duplicates in that, but, uh, uh, but it's a hundred people. Uh, there's, there's very, there's a lot of more worthy candidates that we can award, but every year we have to pick, uh, we have to pick one winner from each category, male and female. And um, so, yeah. Okay, great. So let's talk about these esteemed individuals. So let's talk about Maggie Lehman first. She won the Ira Thomas award. What made her stand out? Well, really, it's her involvement and her senior level position at Osisco Developments. Uh, Maggie is the the VP of Exploration for uh, Osisco, or one or, or a company within the Osisco Group, who we know well. And in fact, 
Um, Jose Vizquerez won the award um, two, two or three years ago for the Further Peter Monk. So uh, the Osisco family is no stranger to, uh, to the awards from, from YMP's perspective. But, but really the, for, for a young uh, woman such as Maggie to have such a senior role at such an established group, uh, being in control of such a significant project as the Caribou uh, really stood out to us. We had a number of very interesting women from all over the world, a few from Australia, a few from Europe, but but Maggie really did stand out this year. So uh, so we're very pleased. Unfortunately, I've never had the opportunity to meet her. I wish uh, I wish we were having the award ceremony in person. I'd look forward to meeting her there. But uh, but I I'm sure I'll pass uh, cross paths with her one of these one of these years. Great. And what is her role at OSISCO Development? She's the Vice President of Exploration. So she's effectively in charge of, of running their exploration program, which is a substantial program. It, my understanding is there's multiple drills. It's a multi-million ounce deposit. Uh, anything the OSISCO group gets behind, they get behind in a big way with lots of access to capital. They don't mess around. They get to the drills. And, and I can attest that running a drill program is a, is a substantial job. So for Maggie to be in, in control of, of uh, making those types of decisions and managing a team of that size, which is required for a program of, of that scale, uh, she's got a lot of weight on her shoulders, so it's very impressive. It is, and it's uh, it's an impressive company to have that kind of role in. So yeah, I can see uh, I can see how that works. So is she going to give a speech at the at this event, or how does that work? She will. So yeah, I think it's uh, it's uh, May 18th at 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we'll be hosting the actual awards. Uh, Maggie will be saying a few words, as uh, will. Uh, at least one, maybe two of her, uh, call it bosses, C level. I believe Sean and uh, Sean Rusin and Chris Loader are expected to to join us and and sort of introduce and say a few words about Maggie. And uh, and the same will hold true for for Mr. Fenton as well, who's the Peter Monk Award winner. So yeah, every it's going to be a you know a typical ceremony, but held virtually. Okay, and finally, before we move on to. Matthew Fenton. What does Maggie win as a winner? Is it just an award or does she actually get a prize? It's glory. <laughs> glory. <laughs> Nothing more than glory. No, it's, it's, no, there's, uh, we are a not for profit organization. It's just recognition. Uh, yeah. she, we, we, we do give her a, uh, a trophy of sorts, but there's, there's no monetary value. I think it's just the, the pride of, of being recognized by, by your peers. I, I think it's just a, it's a, it's a good positive event. Uh, and, uh, there's nothing more than the, the the joy of knowing that you get the recognition. Sure, and that is worth uh, that is worth a lot. Uh, so, okay, so if we turn over then to Matthew Fenton, what made Matthew stand out? He's with Magris Resources. And what does he do, and why did he win? So he is the uh, the president and chief financial officer of, of Magris Resources, and, and Magris is a private. It's a private company, so they. They aren't as uh, splashy in their communications as a publicly traded company would be who needs to maintain their communications to support their share prices. So so it's probably a little harder for, for Matthew and for Magris to gain the visibility. And so uh, I think that almost works against Matthew in terms of getting public recognition. But I think he stood out and that sort of speaks to, to how important his role is at Magris. Uh, his uh, boss would be Aaron Regent. Uh, Aaron Region, of course, is a very well-known guy back with Falconbridge and Brookfield and Barrick. And, and now, of course, he, he led the, the fundraising and is the, the chief guy there. And I, I, my understanding is that uh, Matthew is his right hand. Uh, I've known Matthew for a number of years, and uh, he's, a, he's a bright, outstanding uh, young individual. I believe he's only 35 years old. And, and I think he sort of runs the day-to-day -day of, of Magaris, and, and I think a large Probably what takes up the the better part of his is ours is running the Niobec mine, which is a, a niobium producer in Quebec, which has a storied history. And I know the niobium industry is very complex. It's not necessarily a spot market where you can just sell your gold to the London Metals Exchange or to a uh, refinery. The the end user of that product is highly highly specialized. So there's involves a lot of travel, uh, highly sophisticated operation. And, and I understand they're also getting into the talc business as well. So, so Matt is, uh, I think he's a, he's a CA. He's been a key part of, of Magris, which my understanding, um, again, I don't know their financials as they're private, but I, but I, I reckon they're a very successful operator and he's a key part of that. 
And what made him stand out, though, other than, say, his role and that he sort of had success at the company? Was there, there sort of like leadership qualities that somehow come out or, you know, like what, what was the X factor there? Well, I think the X factor for me was his ability to give back uh, outside of his, his, call it his day job. At YMP, we take the ability to give back or the investment in their time to give back to be key. And so he's involved with a series of of not-for-profits and charities that have raised substantial money uh, over the years, which is something that you know I hope we could talk about too. What YMP does itself, but but Matthew independently is has been involved in giving back. And I think when you see young leaders taking the time and investing to give back, that sets them apart. And, and Matt uh, clearly has done that. Absolutely. You know, it's always kind of a magical thing to see someone under forty giving to charity. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's most people under 40 are just trying to, you know, get a, a roof over their head for the most part. So, yeah, that is very impressive. So he's also going to be making a speech. And again, this is March 18th from 7 to 8 p.m. online event. The uh, link is in the story at the Northern Miner. And there's also and what's your website again? Youngminingprofessionals.com. That's correct. Youngminingprofessionals.com. All of our information uh, is available there, as well as information on this year's winners and past winners. Okay, excellent. Now let's talk about your other, I don't know if I'd call it a product. Let's talk about the Young Mining Professionals Scholarship Fund. This is a separate thing, as far as I understand. Could you tell me about what you guys are doing there? Well, the Young Mining Professionals Scholarship Fund is a registered Canadian charity. It is a, it's a, it's a distinct legal entity in that it's a charity. It's not a part of the not-for-profit, but it's obviously very much affiliated in its efforts and the people who operate it. Its mandate is very simple. That is to encourage young people to study and stay studying into earth sciences, be it geology or mine engineering. It was started uh, four years ago. And uh, we've grown it every single year since then. I think it was the first year was twelve thousand dollars. The second year was in the thirties. Uh, last year we gave uh, about sixty-two thousand dollars away. And this year in twenty twenty-one, we're going to be announcing the details uh, in the coming weeks. But we expect uh, we're, right now we're over ninety thousand dollars. Our goal is to get over a hundred thousand dollars that we'll give away directly to students. And uh, I will emphasize that as a part of our charity, what sets us apart, you talked about setting things apart, we give away 100% of the, those dollars. So every dollar that we receive from any partner that wants to, to, to create a scholarship to entice students to study in our industry, that money flows directly to them. So there is no administrative costs. Uh, everybody here is a 100% volunteer. All of our expenses that we incur, uh, which are fairly marginal, but you you know it, it takes money to stay alive in terms of bank charges, internet charges, that sort of stuff. It's all covered by our not-for-profit. So that's how we structure it. So that every dollar that comes in from one of our partners, whether it's Barrick, Agnico, Yamana, Kinross, I am Gold, the list goes on. They have the comfort to know that that dollar flows directly to the young people where it's needed. So I think that is a that's a that's that was a, a foundational part of how we started this charity. I believe it sets us apart because there's a lot of great charities out there, but almost all of them have some sort of salary or administration component, which takes away from what the ultimate goal is. So we're very, very proud of that. And we're proud of how we've been able to grow it. And I can't wait to come out with this year's roster of partners. We've got a lot of new companies uh, coming to us this year. New new partners include Alamos, Gold, Equinox, B2 Gold. Uh, returning partners are going to be, of course, the org group, which I'm responsible uh, for, is coming back, has been involved every year. And then we've got Barrick, as I've noted, Agnico Eagle, Yamana, uh, Ken Ross, and, and I am Gold, and uh, and Champion Iron Ore as well. And of course, I could, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention we've got a, a very special scholarship with the Northern Miner again this year. Good to hear. And so a lot of students listen to this program. Are they too late? Like, what are the dates? Like, if, if they're interested in this scholarship, we must have a lot of geologists here who would be potentially interested. Where do they go? What are the dates? Like, how do they get into this? Well, you go to our website, theyoungminingprofessionals.com, and you will see a, uh, a drop down on our toolbar called the Young Mining Professional or YMP Scholarships. Click on that. All of the information is available. By and large, we have not announced our 2021 program. We will be doing so in April. So give us a month and we'll have this year's 
slate ready to go. There is a scholarship that's open right now. It's the why it's the uh, I am Gold scholarship, which we announced a little while ago. So so you can actually apply for a scholarship right now. But in another month, we will have probably a dozen new scholarships announced. And I should note each of them are a little bit different. So this, these are not generic scholarships. They Every single one of our partners customizes to suit their needs and wants. Uh, for example, Agnico Eagle has a scholarship that's specific to students who live north of 60 because they've got uh, big operations up in, in, in Meliodine. Uh, and so they want that scholarship to go back to the communities. And the same same, same holds true for, for every company. They just they customize it. They come to us and they say, how can we make uh, this special? And there's various ways we do that. So in April, each of those criteria will be posted. Obviously, academic achievement is, is usually a consideration, but there's also creative components. There are financial uh, assistance requirements if, if you're unable to meet your scholarship so or your, your tuition payment. So there's a lot of different criteria we met. It's not just about getting 100 percent in school because we recognize there's just so many other factors. And what I remember about this scholarship is there are some very generous awards uh, that are given. Do you know what's coming up this year? Like, what, what's the top prize, or are you guys still figuring that out? The the largest uh, scholarship we give is uh, ten thousand dollars, and that's from Barrick, uh, as well as Agnico gives ten thousand dollars. There are uh, Kinross, for example, gives twelve and a half thousand dollars, but that's separated into smaller tranche scholarships. So again, every company. I would say $10,000 is the typical annual amount that a company partners with us to give away. And it's at their discretion to decide if they want it as a single scholarship or two scholarships or four scholarships, et cetera. But yeah, $10,000 moves the needle. But, you know, so does so does $5,000. Uh, you know, tuition ranges for anywhere from $5,000 to, to $7,000, I would estimate, for for undergraduate um, in, in Canada, at least. So that really makes a difference. It does move the needle. And I think it's, it's particularly at this time, our industry suffers from a huge talent gap. It has for a long time. Now that the industry is, is much healthier than it was a year or two ago, getting people to qualified people to get on site is, is a challenge right now as we ramp up. For the past six, seven years, it hasn't been uh, attractive for young people to get into this industry, spend four years, accumulate the debt only to come out with a no prospect of jobs. So we really uh, we really have a tough time sourcing individuals. So this program is aimed at making it easier and more attractive for them to come into our industry so we can smooth out those peaks and valleys a little bit for the betterment of our industry. Yeah. And I, you know, like for, from the student perspective, what I like about this is, you know, if you get five or ten thousand dollars, you know, what do you make as a part time barista at Starbucks? You know, like over the course of a school year, maybe five or ten thousand dollars. Like it's not going to be a ton of money. So, you know, that can potentially just save that person from having to spend 20 hours a week in, in the coffee shop. And instead, they'll be a customer at the coffee shop reading their geology. Oh, absolutely. I mean, $10,000 $10, is no joke uh, for anybody, but especially for a student. It pays their tuition, it takes the pressure off, allows them to focus on other things, uh, partic hopefully that's school. Uh, and, and also there are, I should also note that in addition to the monetary incentives that our scholarships provide, there are many scholarships, customized scholarships that allow for intern opportunities. So a lot of these companies view it as not only giving back, I think that's the primary goal is to give back, but they want access to young talent. And so they get to meet. So when when the how the, the scholarships are awarded, we vet them. So we do we make it as easy as possible for our partners because there is a lot of logistics and selecting and organizing and accumulating in this data, let alone advertising it. And then we deliver all of the candidates to that company and they get to shortlist the people. And so they've got access to a vetted qualified stream of young people which is a which is a massive bonus if you think about it because hr in this industry especially when there's a dearth of young people uh in our industry right now it's it's a value add to our partners now that's not why they sign up uh but i think it's it's certainly a value add and if they can uh you know the the, the intern component of it is not necessarily baked into every scholarship and it's no guarantee it has to be a mutual fit but I think if if a young person can get ten thousand uh, dollars in cash to help them out with their expenses and tuition, plus an interview at a company like Barrick, what a phenomenal opportunity! I wish I had something like that when I was a 
and I was a greenhorn. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. I mean, I'm not mining uh, per se, but uh, yeah, I mean, the the internship could be worth like way more than that fancy ten thousand dollars scholarship, which also sounds great, but. Um, okay, well, excellent. That sounds really great. And just finally, just on the org group, uh, it's been in the news a, a couple of weeks ago. I saw there's something in Saskatchewan. I don't know if it was Baseload, the name of the company, and it's a company you're associated with. So I just wanted to ask you about that um, before we go. Uh, do you have any comment on what happened there? I just sort of saw a news story. I wasn't sure what to make of it. Well, yeah, no, we were a, ba- a company called Baseload was in the news for uh, starting a uh, an exploration project, and the, perhaps there was a little bit of a miscommunication between us and, and the First Nations. We have a fully permitted project. Uh, we uh, we got on site, and then the the community uh, asked us to stop, and so we stopped. And and ever since then, we have been at the table with them, um, looking to get their consent because consent is is so important. And this industry, just because you have a permit from the pro- the province, doesn't necessarily mean you have permission from from the community and social license. So, 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 yeah, we had uh, we had that that the situation. It's been re- you know I would say it's, it's constantly being resolved because these relationships are not uh, a single transaction. It's it's a it's a process. And uh, we're back at the table. We're negotiating. I have absolute confidence that our team at Baseload is going to find a a quick resolution and we'll be back at, out there on the ground in no time. The good news is the community is, is very much open to exploration, um, which is great because that's how wealth is developed and in, in particularly in, in the northern parts where there's not a lot of economic development. Uh, this is normal course for, for the industry as a whole. Everybody wants to make sure that all stakeholders get a piece of the pie. It's only fair. Uh, but at the same time, it, it's, it's critical that it, exploration work be allowed to continue uh, if done correctly and responsibly, which I think the industry does an excellent job of. I think it has uh, too often um, uh, painted with a negative brush. I really do think the mining and exploration industry is is head and shoulders above uh, other industries when it comes to ESG because we've faced these issues for so long. So we, we take great care. But, you know, it, there's there's lots of uh, there's lots of considerations uh, to to consider when you're planning something as, as complex as that. So so anyways, base load is is going to be back to business in no time uh, on on the on the shadow project, uh, and we expect to get the full partnership of the local communities. Okay, well thank you. This is Stephen Stewart, chairman of Young Mining Professionals and chairman of the Young Mining Professionals Scholarship Fund, and chairman of the Org Group. Thank you once again for joining us. It's, it's been a pleasure, Adrian. Thank you very much. We'll talk soon. Pretty cool award. Uh, if you're a student, I'd go to Young Mining Professionals' website and check that out. Free money is free money. And it sounds like they have a lot of variety of awards for different people. It's not just about the marks and don't forget the internships because those may be the most valuable thing you can get so with that thank you once again for joining me on the program thank you to steven stewart if you want to help out the podcast share it with your friends and leave us a review on the apple podcast directory until next week take care